Oh yeah, what's up everybody? Welcome. Welcome to the Artists of Data Science, Data Science Happy Hour. I'm so glad you guys are here to join me today. It's been an awesome week at the podcast. Had released an episode with Nir Bashan earlier this week. I hope you guys had an opportunity to check that episode out. I absolutely loved talking to Nir. I know you guys are going to love hearing the conversation we had. Before we get started, guys, I just want to do a quick shout out for my sister. My little sister, Jazz, has built an amazing app called Close By. Close By is a tool that lets you know if what you're shopping for on Amazon can be found at a small business. It's 100% free, helps you discover new indie merchants and see what they have in stock. Uh, this holiday season, find unique gifts for the lo- for your loved ones and you're doing all of this while helping support small and local businesses. Check it out, guys. I uh, hope you guys get an opportunity to um, download the app. And yeah, welcome, 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 everybody. Wow, the uh, office hour is popping, man. Thank you guys so much for for coming. I'm really, really excited to have all you guys here. Um, so yeah, let's uh, let's open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions? I do. <clears throat> um, I have been uh, delving into Tableau uh, recently, and I am trying to understand where what the line is between when you would say, I can do this in, say, Python versus I should do this in Tableau instead, or maybe I can do this in SAS, or I should do this in Tableau instead for, you know, I know, Ray, that's like what you do all the time. So can you kind of help me understand like what the what the limits are or where it'd be just smarter to do one or the other? Ray, I'll let you take that one over. You're muted, Ray. Oh. No, can't hear you. Yeah, still not. So the question, if I could just repeat it, is oh Ray, there you go. You can hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. I, I don't know what's going on with this. I recently got a new laptop uh, for work, and I'm using that. And anyway, uh, well, I'm still learning on like the R and Python side, but I do do um, ETL in SAS. So sometimes I do some analysis in there versus having uh, it done in Tableau. So it's like, kind of like the standard consultant's answer. It depends. You know, so I'll think about like how hard is it to do what I'm trying to do in you know whatever language tool I'm in. Um, you know, if it's simple stuff like um, uh, like summaries, averages, uh, you know, some basic stats, means, and stuff like that, I'll do that right in a query in SAS. If I'm going to be doing more like slicing and dicing, I'll take it into Tableau because you know doing it's a great tool for. Uh, exploratory data analysis. Uh, so I know I'm just kind of talking around your question and not really answering it, but that's kind of my approach. And Eric, when it comes to using Tableau, is Eric here? Where is he? I don't see him. Um, I think he's here somewhere. Not Eric. Uh, <laughs> not not Eric. I meant Joe. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Eric. <laughs> Joe, from a a architecture standpoint, if we're using um, Tableau, like what do you see being an issue, right? Because typically if we're using Tableau, it's not just for us to do our own exploratory analysis as data scientists. It's usually to give to some stakeholders so that they can interact with it and, and play around with the data, right? And usually that's going to require some type of back end processing of, you know, some type of pipeline that takes the raw data models it and then puts it somewhere where then Tableau can sit on top of it, right? Yep. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you'll see people using Tableau, um, Tableau server and just doing one of the maybe data transformations in there. I think uh, we're typically pulled up to help people out of that problem when the uh, Tableau server starts crashing. So uh, we recommend, uh, and also my, my uh, colleague Matt Allison, he's on the uh, line too, so. Good to meet everyone. Yeah. It, uh, he's he's a smarter half of Ternary. Um, so, but in either case, I'd recommend backing your putting your data into something like a data warehouse, 
um, and dimensionally modeling that data, and then uh, surfacing that dimensional model to business users that also facilitates things like maybe self serve analytics if you didn't go that route. Um, so if it's basically a project you said you and your close team, uh, definitely consider ways to, um, from an infrastructure standpoint, to make the data always available, um, uh, fast query performance, right? So I remember one of our clients, they, they had architected it, so they're, um, they're using a data warehouse where the uh, machine kept getting pegged. Uh, so that was one thing. So writing a bunch of queries and transformations in that data warehouse, and uh, the warehouse was at capacity, and then their Tableau server was also at capacity, so the business wasn't pleased at all. The um, person in charge of analytics was getting calls from the CEO, like, um, a lot. The calls you don't want to get. So let's say if it's something besides, uh, like I said, um, uh, analytics, we can definitely consider something like that. Hope that helps. Is this a good time for a DBT shout out to maybe or some other back end tools that take care of some of these details in SQL that maybe are hard to do directly from Tableau? Shout it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. How many of you here have used DBT before? No, not used it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So what is it? Uh, so DBT is basically it's a tool that brings you could almost call it like object oriented capabilities to SQL, right? Like that's the huge headache with SQL. SQL can do all kinds of transformations, but there's no notion really of libraries or managing code or anything like this. And so DBT t helps you to take care of some of those details and then also manages um, transformation workflows for you. And so in terms of like putting it back in behind Tableau that's SQL based, DBT lets you do that when maybe it's not practical to put Python in that back end. And you can potentially take some complex Python flows as well and then translate them into DBT language. Oh, uh, so can, so I just wanted it to oh. <laughs> go ahead, Mupri, go oh, ahead. <laughs> so does it work like an ETL tool that we use? for scheduling the services? Sorry? Does it work like an ETL tool, the DBT thing? Mm, it's different. So DBT is a package where everything is, uh, it's built for analysts, right? So you'll, you'll start hearing this term more and more called analytics engineering. Um, it's a new buzzword that's popping up. Um, I'll but, write that down. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's new range. Actually, there's new job titles for it and stuff. People are hiring analytics engineers now. But the point is, um, DBT allows analysts to create their own data transformation pipelines using nothing but select statements. So that's pretty cool. So you could make slowly changing dimensions, you can make fact tables dimensions using um, simple select statements. Um, DBT adoption is um, growing at an insane clip right now. I would say that there's two schools of thought right now, like traditional data tools that you probably are more familiar with, like your Informaticos, your Talons, or whatever, but then, there's more of the um, analytics engineering by code and infrastructure as code, uh, which is a DBT route that I think you're, it's, if you haven't seen it now, you're gonna start seeing a lot more of it in 2021, especially since the company behind DBT, Fishtown Analytics, just raised like uh, $45 million a couple of weeks ago. And that, that's on top of like 30 something million or whatever, don't quote me on the, the series A, but um, a few months ago, right? So they got enough money to, plow into this project and it's getting widespread adoption. So I'd say that might be an alternative to just run all your transformations in DBT and then back to the original point, hook up Tableau um, to that data warehouse doing that. And that frees you of a lot of administrative burden for relying on DBAs or any of that stuff. So. so I wanted to swing back around if I could to Eric's original question, because are you, Eric, were you talking about you as the individual analyst when you pick one or the other? Generally speaking, when you're talking about sharing something with Tableau in an organization, because it costs so much money, that's usually decided for you up front. There's usually some sort sure. of standard, some sort of practice. So I was just wondering, are you talking about you by yourself? Or when do you decide to actually buy Tableau versus Power BI or something else? Yeah, I think I'm more talking about me by myself. Because if I'm in an organization and we have Tableau available, then there's going to be some like you said, there's going to be some standard of like, people are like, well, I need this in a dashboard, so please put it in Tableau. It's like, no problem. But I was wondering as I'm looking at it and it's, you know, you know, low code versus low code or no code solutions. And are there certain times when it's like, it's just way easier to just do it one way or the other, anything that you'd kind of come across. So that's where I was So thinking. just rule number one, I want everyone to understand this. There is no such thing as no code. 
does not Someone exist. Else do not it. buy. Do not buy it. Maybe low code if you're lucky. Maybe, but never no code. So what I would say, Eric, in answer to your question is, whatever's fastest. If you know you can get stuff done faster in Tableau, use that. If you know you can get stuff done faster in Python, use that. That's why I typically use Excel most of the time. And then when I know I can do something faster in R, that's why I fire up Art Studio. Cool. Thank you. I don't know. Hopefully that answered your question. I just want to take a moment real quick to just point out that there are three people in this chat right now who have been guests on the Artist of Dave Size podcast. Obviously there's Carlos, but my good friend Makiko is also here today who I miss dearly. She was a uh, mentor with me at Data Science Dream Job Makiko. Thank you so much for showing up. And then we also have Brandon Quach, uh, which was hands down one of my absolute favorite episodes that are recorded this year. So if you guys get an opportunity to check that one out, uh, thank you guys so, so much for, for coming. A um, lot of awesome people here today, and I know a lot of you guys have questions. So Eric, thank you for that great question. Let's go ahead and move on. If anybody else has a question, um, how about this? Just raise your hand and I'll call you. Carlos. I, have, I have a question because you brought up Tableau and some other stuff. So Salesforce bought Tableau, Salesforce bought Slack recently. What are we expecting to see from these major companies and how will it affect data science? Because I think we're seeing a lot of aggregation of tools in like a small group. And I want to know what Salesforce is doing next. Because Salesforce Einstein, I don't know it. And I'm surprised how little I hear about it in the data science world. Ben and I are chuckling. Ben, go for it. I chaired a conference once where I had to introduce that guy. What, what is his name, Richard? The, the Salesforce guy. So he had that company, was it Metamine that was bought by Salesforce? Now he's the, so he's in charge of Einstein. He did NLP research at Stanford. Not an important thing, but just a funny fact that I, the conference was freaked out because he didn't show up until like five minutes before the talk. Slacker. So Carlos, I know that didn't answer your question. So if anybody has the answer to Carlos's question. Um, cause what, was the sure first, what was the first part of the question? Salesforce bought Tableau and now they're buying Slack. What's the play for them as they grow? And what should we expect to see in our community related to that kind of fourth power coming up? I don't know. The, the word on the street is that the Slack acquisition is more targeted at Microsoft, at least is what the Wall Street Journal pundit say, right? So who knows? I mean, Salesforce is a juggernaut, though. So uh, it means to be seen. But I think as far as Einstein goes, I mean, I haven't, I think to echo your point, like, at least in the circles that I run in, Einstein was more of a running joke after a bit. Um, people had implemented it at Salesforce, or they, you know, they implemented the Salesforce environment, and I don't think they got a lot of value out of it. That's the people I talk to. Maybe there's other people that have gotten value out of it, and Salesforce has enough of a sales and marketing arm that they could make things uh, look successful too. So who knows? But Makiko, I saw you were unmute there. Go for it. Yeah, so um, so when I was over at this little startup called WalkMe, um, I worked for the VP of Revenue Operations there, and he was a director over at Salesforce. And he told the story about how one day he had walked past this glass room where finance was meeting about potential future acquisitions. And he saw a bunch of names on that list, and this was like maybe three, four years ago at least. Um, and And he was like, yeah, like, you know, and this was when they had acquired Tableau. So from his perspective, he's like, it's very interesting to see like which companies that they acquired next. Um, and then when Slack was acquired, he was like, company two, you know? So I think like, I think number one, like Salesforce, you know, like hats off to them. I worked as a consultant implementing Salesforce, like CRMs and marketing cloud solutions. Um, and like, they are a money-making machine. And I think one of the reasons why they're money making machine is because like they do plan things out years in advance. So for example, the Tableau acquisition was actually planned out many years in advance. Um, but I think part of it, right, is that, so some companies, what they'll do, like there's the IBM model where they will just kind of acquire companies and then they'll just let them run independently. And then there are some companies who I'm sure we can kind of all think of which these companies are, they will buy companies to kind of kill them just to like kill out competition in that space. 
Um, and then there are other companies who like, they will sort of like buy companies out to incorporate and augment kind of their own like products and services. Autodesk was very, is very famous for doing this. Uh, I worked there too. They had about 70 plus products after like their biggest wave of layoffs in the last couple of years, still across like mobile desktop and across these different industries. And their whole thing was we're gonna buy it. We're gonna kind of like, you know, like white label it or, or rebrand it and then and kind of incorporate into the stack. I don't think that's what Salesforce is doing. I think Salesforce recognizes that first off, like tools like Slack um, and Tableau, although they have like, you know, B2C adoption, like people love those tools. Um, they're really money makers for like the enterprise level. Um, so I, I don't know who's ever been a, in a vendor kind of conversation with Tableau in Slack, but they're actually really expensive at the enterprise level, but they're really good. So it's like one of these things where if you know your worth, you know, you can kind of like charge it accordingly. Um, and so I think like Salesforce recognized that first off, these are actually enterprise tools. They're not really B2C, right? So, and secondly, they're all tools that their current companies use. And I think anyone who's worked with like Salesforce data and Tableau can tell you that like, it'll crap out after the first X gigabytes, right? Like you can't even run those tables. And so I think they probably bought Tableau. They're gonna improve the connection to Tableau. Um, they're also probably gonna bring in a lot of their expertise in security. Salesforce also has not been broken into as much as like other tech companies. Um, they, they still have, but like their security breaches have not been as significant, I think, as other companies in the space. Um, and then they're kind of like gonna let them like run independently. At some point they might try to like rebrand them, um, but I think it won't be for a while. Now in terms of like as like an analyst or as a data scientist or as a machine learning engineer, I don't think kind of like your role will change. Hopefully it just means that when you work with a dashboard in Tableau that is like Salesforce data heavy, it's not gonna crash or they will try to build some like intermediary tools for like data prep. Data prep is probably the, the sub product of Tableau that will see the most impact and change because that's the one that is not as used, frankly, by a lot of analysts and like data scientists. Um, but it's also something where it could be super useful. They've already got a skeleton there, so they can kind of like, like really boost it up even more. So I don't think like your role as a data scientist or machine learning engineer or anything will change in that regard. It just might get a little bit easier. Um, if you're a director, then you know, you're gonna have to figure out the, the bundling on that, but they will probably like Tableau did recently, they will change their pricing to make it easier to acquire those tools. So that's just kind of like my, my hot take. I love this okay. business talk. Yeah, right on. Brandon, do you have any, any comments on that? No, I, I we visited Tab, uh, not to Salesforce and met couple of people from Einstein, but that was a couple of years back. So, you know, I would imagine that a lot more has been done at that time. They were just meeting each other. People were, I mean, I'm, I'm there as a, as a potential customer and people from Salesforce are like introducing themselves to each other. So that's how I knew, like, this is a very recent thing. Uh, but I have, I don't have the latest news. So like I said, that was like two, two years ago. Right on. Thanks. Thank you, Makigo. That was very, very in depth. I love that. Um, Let's see if anybody else has questions. Again, at this point, if you guys have questions, just to wait. I don't want to stay on this topic. I just want to point out what I think. I yeah, think yeah. Go a, for it. Like Microsoft, Google, Amazon, right? And we know which one's in third place in cloud. I feel like Salesforce is a Microsoft Office suite, a G suite away from like joining that group in a lot of enterprise ways. And I think that's, I was kind of expecting to hear more about that. So, I mean, that, that's like what I imagine is their five year vision. Um, if they really want to do that and be an enterprise thing and have cloud, that's like, you know, like AWS and stuff like that. All right, next question. I don't think you, and just want to shout out that also David Tello has joined, who is also a guest on the podcast. Um, also one of my absolute favorite episodes as well. So check his episode out. David, thank you for being here. All right, cool. So if anybody has a question, feel free to just flag me down with a wave. If not, then I'll just um, scroll down. Right, um, yeah, definitely go for it. I see you go for it. So a lot of big names in here. Uh, hi, all. Of the people who do hiring, has there been anything that stuck out on a resume for data science, machine learning, for whatever, any kind of position like that? What's the one, you know, top three things they've seen on a resume that really sticks out at you on maybe on a recent hire this year? 
Anyone who wanted to open? Yeah. Yeah, for me, it's an interesting project name that will immediately capture my attention. And then following that up with a well thought out, well constructed project, I think that is something that I personally look for and really does grab my attention. Um, how about how about you, Brandon? What do you think? Yeah, I was thinking about that when you had asked. Um, I nothing that stuck out particularly. Like I can't think of a specific thing, and I think that's what you're asking. Like a specific thing that I saw. I mean, I just generally look this year, like a highlight from this year, a recent hire that you're like, wow, I'm really glad I got this guy, and I, I only got him because this part of his resume said X Y Z. Not at the resume level. At the interview level, yes. At the resume level, it was more of, I look for people who are doing outside projects, passion projects on their own. And if they happen to have that, that, that helps a lot. Uh, that would be my short answer for that. I know Ben does a lot of, uh, you know, he's, he's well-versed in this recruiting space. Um, yeah, we, well, I, we actually did a project where we analyzed 400,000 resumes, not data science resumes. There were, was part of that. So we did built a neural network on that data set when I was at higher view. But the, I think the thing that's really surprising when you get on the hiring side is the, the, the disappointment that all the resumes look the same. And these are good resumes. So for everyone on the call, if you have your resume and you're very proud of your resume, maybe you, you wrote it in LaTeX or is it LaTeX? Like what? LaTeX, right? So you wrote your resume. It looks amazing. Latex. It looks like LaTeX. It looks like 20 other resumes or 50 other resumes. Everyone puts in the same keywords. So the thing that really stands out, uh, like Brandon said, it's the passion projects. And, and I've joked with other data science managers about the theoretical resume that doesn't exist. Imagine if you had a resume and it was like four Git commits to, that went into public projects. And you could just go look. And I think the last thing I'll throw in there is interviews, they suck because you don't have enough time to really evaluate the candidate. Like to really evaluate the candidate, you don't have enough time. Resume is even worse. And so when you're interviewing to go get a job, you're actually, you're perceived as being, especially as a junior data scientist, you're not, you're not as good as everyone on my team. So everyone on my team is better at MXNet than you. And that's the perception, even if you have a project with that. But if you have a Git commit that got accepted into one of those projects, what does that do to my perception? It actually turns it completely upside down. I think you must know more about that framework than everyone else on my team. And I'm not saying that's an easy thing to do. People get frustrated when I say this because like, ugh, like it's, it's not an easy thing to do for you to go get a, something committed into a public project. But that's something we've talked about that that would really stand out. Does cleaning up variable names count? <laughs> Uh, I, I guess they'll go look at that commit, but it's still it's still impressive that you found something. There, there's a lot of low hanging fruit. I've been really surprised. Open source projects that we just rely on all the time. There's a lot of technical debt that is alive and well in these projects. And when you start looking at the code, you realize, ooh, yikes! Like there's like a MXNet has like a an exception for to check whether or not you have OpenCV. Like the way they've written it, you're like, whoa, what is this doing buried in the code? And why is this still here? It's, well. It's not a priority and they don't have enough people working on it. Has so anybody else made any hiring decisions this year? And if so, what was something that stood out to you on a resume? So why I asked that is I, for the last couple of years, I've been involved on the other side of recruiting, bringing people into our, our company. And um, so I get to review the resumes. And I know that every resume that comes across, you get like half a minute FaceTime with it before you're like, you know what? No, or you know what? Yes. I have an old manager who used to make the joke. I take the half the stack of resumes throw it in the trash because he doesn't hire unlucky people. So like resume is your first few seconds into the door. Um, so that's for software engineering. Like we'll list out every language we've done Hello World when we'll, uh, we'll do all the projects, all the GitHubs that we have, but I don't know what it looks like for a data science resume. So if you look at my resume, it says machine learning in like maybe two spots, but it's two pages of software engineering because I've been in this space for like eight years. But now coming into data science is like, what should I be putting is what I'm after. I think the thing yeah, about so data science is like, it's, it's a meta skill, right? Data science isn't just one particular skill. It is a skill that comprises several other distinct, discrete skills, right? You've got to be able to code. You got to be able to think like a businessman. You got to be able to think like an engineer, right? You got to be able to think in all these different ways, wear these different hats, right? So like data science itself is a meta skill and it's hard to evaluate, I think, a meta skill on a resume unless you have a very concrete, tangible 
artifact that showcases your ability to flex these meta skills. Dave Linger, what do you think? Yeah, so I was going to say, I haven't done any hiring this year um, because I'm also a solo entrepreneur right now, so I'm not hiring anybody. But in years past, um, what I would typically look at is I'd get somebody's resume, and to be honest with you guys, I wouldn't even read it. First thing I would do is I'd look at the name, and then I'd go find them on LinkedIn, and I would check them out on social media. Because to, to Harpreet's point, yeah, you know Python, you know this, you know that, blah, 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 blah. Can you communicate? Have you done public speaking? Do you have projects? Do you post? Do you have intelligent conversations with people in the space? So that's what I would typically do. So I'm not as bad as like taking half of the resumes at random and throwing them away. But I would say, look, people that don't have a social media presence, they would definitely get put on the back burner. And I would concentrate on people that have a social media presence because that was a way for me as a hiring manager. They ascertain, do they have this eclectic mix of skills that we call quote unquote data science these days? Yeah, I mean, I haven't done the hiring this year either, but I mean, I've built several data teams in the past. And I think to echo Dave's point, I, I'll scan the resumes. I, don't, I wouldn't say I read them in depth because it's a lot of in-depth reading to do. Um, but the things that I would focus on was, like the first thing is if you have like any real world experience, I think it kind of bumps you up, uh, right? Um, and I mean, I can't, even, I can't even remember how many, uh, you know, PhD candidates have rejected just because they didn't have any experience over somebody who did have experience. I, I don't really care that you have a PhD. That's nice. Um, but, I, you know, if, if I, we could find somebody who has real world um, engineering experience, machine learning experience, for example, I'd much rather wait on that because, uh, or put emphasis on that uh, precisely because I, my team has work to get done and I don't have enough time to really get you up to speed. And maybe that's particular to my problem, but um, again, that's the sort of role that I was hiring for in particular. But to echo uh, what Dave was saying too, like, you know, I'll, I'll do a lot of homework on the, on the resumes that I do like. Um, and I always keep the, the resumes that I've rejected too, because there's, there's probably a lot of false negatives in there, right? Yeah, what, what I job, like to say, oh, you, sorry, go. Right, but your job as a hiring manager is to say no quickly. Like you're not there to say yes. Like you're, you're supposed to filter people through and, and get to a candidate as quickly as possible. Um, a good candidate, preferably. But your job is to find as many reasons to say no as possible to somebody, not reasons to, say, to accept somebody. And it sounds horrible, but that's how it works. So. And yeah, after- when I was a hiring manager, if you, if you had yourself up, a, like you did a meetup and it was recorded and you were on YouTube and I could watch you explain a technical concept with just great eloquence, you're coming in for an interview. Totally. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. Ben, after after you go, I'd love to hear what Jennifer looks for in a resume. So, uh, Jennifer, you're going to be on the spot after Ben. I just had a memory from the hedge. So I worked at a hedge fund, and oh, my gosh, resumes. So the hedge fund would freak out about these resumes they could find, and I don't know where they found these resumes. So the hedge fund manager's reading this resume, and he's like, this is amazing. I love this resume. I'm like, what does it say? The very top of this kid's resume, in bold, it says, I won the 2011 International Graduate School Coding Competition, where you're like, like you'd react like, wow. And then the next line says, but I was disqualified because I was only 17. And his resume starts, you're like, what the hell? Like, I'm, I'm pathetic. Like, that's what you think. So the hedge fund would find these resumes of these people. I'm not saying that's normal. And this, uh, that's not even a useful thing to tell this audience. I just thought that when I think of a resume, I think of like these legendary hedge fund resumes they would find, oh my gosh. Have you guys ever seen a resume like that? Like some like two yeah. line statement at the top to shut up. Like, uh, well, how about 11 year old kid? Quite a few resumes like that in my career where, and, and I would say for even pedigree people, um, it's, a, it's like a coin flip almost, right? Cause I, I've, I've worked with people who, you know, Ivy League graduates and, um, you know, top in their field and all this stuff. And I, I swear to God, these people like self implode half the time. So it kind of doesn't, I, that's where I just learned not to, not to really care about the resume too much because it's after a bit, I mean, you know, Matt and I worked with somebody who was one of the world's leading endocrinologists on a, on a deal and that went <laughs> in a different direction and it's just, you never know. Um, people are people. So there's the resume part and there's also the part that they're going to work out when you hire them, right? So anyway. There's the 11 year old kid that presents at Data Carry Conference. That's a resume headline. Uh, Jennifer, yeah, let's hear what, what you look for. 
A lot of what we do at Intel is really similar to what I'm hearing here. The first thing I do is I go out and look at LinkedIn. Um, it's a very, you know, canned resume usually. They do all look alike. That does not surprise me a bit. Do something to make it look different. Um, if you do data visualizations, why is that not on your cover letter? Why is that not embedded in your resume? Do something that really stands out. Um, I've seen some that are just different columns with, with things in it. It just helps it stand out. A single word, not gonna make or break something. But if your LinkedIn profile has additional files that I can click on, has things I could, boy, a YouTube presentation, you're right, Dave, that would be fantastic. So I, I just wanna shout out Nicole real quick. She wrote a really awesome article uh, this week talking about the interview that I did with Carl Gold. Thank you, Nicole, for writing that. That was a very well-written article. Um, sure thing. I'm wondering, do you got any, any contribution to this discussion regarding resumes? Quantify everything. I don't think we've touched on that point yet. Um, figure out how to make everything internally consistent. So if you are putting periods at the end of bullet points, just keep that rolling throughout the whole resume. Don't like, like have different sections formatted in different ways by then. And uh, consultants like to have things go in groups of three. So I had my first point on, <laughs> my first point on quantification and adding numbers. The second point on like having consistent um, like grammatical formatting. And then the third point is just, if you can figure out some way to, you know, always have a third bullet um, or at least an odd number of items in each list, I think that that's, that's a nice to have. Thank you very much, Nicole. I want to open it up to some of the newer people that have come in. First of all, Greg Hokia is here. Thank you so much for hanging out, Greg. Um, I see Manpreet has her hand up. So Manpreet, if you got a question, go for it. Then after Manpreet, I'd love to see if uh, Timothy Gordon has a question or maybe even uh, Chantanel. I hope I'm saying your name right. Um, but yeah, Manpreet, go for it. Um, as you work for a corporate company, you do multiple projects. So how do you incorporate that in your resume and tell that I had been working on different technologies with different because it seems like you need to have a one page project while you give and apply for a job. So how do you incorporate these things and explain it in just two or three lines? Star format is key. I would say you can bake that in to your resume. You could have a one line opening sentence that says as a X, Y, Z, like, let's just say as a junior data scientist at this company, I had the opportunity to work on several initiatives including the following and then just bullet point situation for this project was dot 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 my task was to do dot 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 the analysis i performed or the actions i took was dot 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 and as a result i observed or achieved dot 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 um, that's pretty much kind of my boilerplate answer to that makiko what do you think because i know you've had a lot of questions like this as part of the I know day. right and I I always have the same like ad libs answer to which is like I used XYZ tools technologies to solve ABC business problem by accomplishing like IJK uh, solution which had an impact of you know the the quantity number I feel like if you give those like that's like a one bullet point you can kind of like dive in deeper if you want to, but I think that's usually like pretty, pretty clear. Um, yeah, it's always just like those like four, but I think people like going back to that resume thing, I don't think, I think a lot of times people put so much information on their resume that they don't need to because sometimes they're a little bit worried about not having enough or not having the right stuff. And then it kind of clouds the clarity. And so I think like, and like, so for my team, we've hired like a lot of people, like when I was over at Livongo, um, if we saw that, you know, where someone was just like, those like th four elements, right? The tool or technology you use, the business problem you're trying to solve, the impact as it was quantified, uh, maybe even the challenge for each project, that would be pretty good. Even if you don't have all of it, that kind of format I think is 
is pretty pretty clear and translates really well. There you go, Manpreet. Hopefully that answered your question. Um, let's go to Timothy. Timothy, if you got any questions, feel free to go for it. And after Timothy, we'll go to Chantanel. Um, hi, can you hear me? Um, but my, my question, well, kind of my question is that like, how do you manage like a imbalanced data set where like, oh, our target variable, variable mates up around the one we're trying to predict mates up around maybe 20% of the actual data set and what are the different tactics that can be used to help, I don't know, better classify that target variable while still being taken into account the, the alternative. And so it's a classification problem and how do we classify something that has only maybe 20% of all of the actual records for it and what are the different tactics people use? I think a common technique, a you know, text, textbook answer, so to speak, would be probably some type of um, uh, synthetic creation of examples. So SMOTE is a good technique, um, but I open the floor up to maybe either Monica or Dave, if you guys got any uh, suggestions um, apart from the answer I just stole from you. Yeah, so the classic ones are you can downsample, you can upsample, you can create synthetic using smoke. Those are the top three. Usually you never know under the no, no free lunch theorem, you never know which one's going to work the best. So usually you try all three. Uh, you can also use something like the um, like the random forest algorithm, for example, allows you to do stratified sampling, which essentially is a form of downsampling. But since you're doing multiple bootstrap iterations, it helps even things out. So that's another thing you can try as well. Uh, Monica or Brandon, any um, advice or tips when it comes to working with imbalanced data for classification tasks? Uh, I would just echo what Dave had said. And uh, also, it, a lot of data science, I think, th that doesn't get discussed is the, the thinking about it, right? The, the thinking like, okay, I tried these three uh, sampling methods, and this one ha works best numerically in terms of, right? And then the thinking about like, do I still want to consider this other one that maybe works second best, but somehow it makes better business sense for what I'm, what, what the objective is, um, you know, because you might do something different if it's fraud or it's a very low sampling rate, you might do something different than if it's, um, I don't know, you just happen to have like data from 2008, you know, or, or some other, like a coronavirus data where you're like, this is totally skewed. This is not a normal year's data. Uh, so, so you, you got to think through like what, what is it that I'm, pro and that, that's when the subject matter expertise comes into play. And then that's when the general thinking comes into play. And, you know, that also goes into hiring for me as well, right? Because I think about like, if I have another data scientist here, what, what do I need help thinking through? And it's always questions like this, where I know what the textbook answers are, right? Yeah, I can read that up in a couple minutes, right? But which one do I want to choose that like really makes the most sense given, given the situation? Right on, thank you. Monica, any other contribution or do we cover all these? I mean, I think everyone summed it up really well, but um, I was going to say that, you know, the domain expertise is really helpful when you're looking at any data set. Um, if, if you don't know the data that's within your industry, it's kind of hard to really decipher anything, any variables, you don't know any any what the categories even mean. So that's, um, in my opinion, the hardest um, skill to obtain from a data scientist. So if you think about the uh, mystical data unicorn, you know, you have your math and statistics, you have the IT hacking knowledge, and then you have that domain expertise. And you, you can always learn math, you can always learn IT stuff, that's kind of those hard skills, but the domain expertise is the longest thing to, to get a grasp of. Timothy, hope that uh, answered your question. Yep, thanks everyone. Awesome. Um, let's open the floor up to, where did he go, Chantanil, and then after Chantanil, um, we will see if Jacqueline has a question, and um, I see Dave had his hand up. We'll, we'll get to you as well, David Tello. Shantanil, go for it. Thank you so much. Like, uh, I'm really happy that I am here asking, I'm going to ask some questions. I have 
all the like always followed you guys out over here on LinkedIn, and it's really great to first time see all of you on a video. I have two. Yeah, questions sorry. <laughs> I have two questions actually. The first one is on the line of what you guys were discussing a little while before on the resume part. Like I have heard a lot of people were saying that all of the resumes kind of look like the same and they don't stand out. Uh, so what would you say would be a uh, like a good example of? Do you say? And I have seen two kinds of resume. One where you have a photo and you have some numbering of the skills that I'm at seven in Python, eight in something else, and all those. And there is one the I think the original ones, the <laughs> or the chronological orders and all those things. Which one would you say uh, would work or Anything else that you might be seeing nowadays that can stand out? I'll open this up to you for either uh, David Tello or Carlos. Carlos looks like you uh, feel very strongly about this. I, uh, I hate seeing seven out of 10 Python, five out of 10. Like, I'm like, that doesn't mean anything, man. Like data science is not the field you want to give me fake numbers about yourself. Like that doesn't make any sense to me. Like just, you have the skill or you don't. And don't put the skill, if I ask you a basic question, you don't know what to do. Like you're allowed to Google in real life, but like people will put crazy stuff. They'll put like, oh yeah, you know, C++. And I'm like, okay, like what have you written in C++? And they say, hello world. And I'm like, dude, you have 50 skills in your resume. Like focus on the 10 you actually know. Like this look, you're gonna look like a clown. Like you want, it's, it's, you want to avoid losses. That's what I want to frame it as. Avoid losses. Don't go for big wins. Like stick to what you got have the LinkedIn, like do all the fundamentals, avoid losses, that's my point. Uh, just to piggyback on uh, Monica and Carlos, you know, um, for example, in the banks, the, there, there are two questions that I think the financial industry is driving right now that everybody wants to know what's gonna happen. The first question is, how are we going to deal with negative rates? Because I mean, there is a sense that they're coming our way. And the second question is, what's going to happen with commercial real estates? I mean, are we going to have the same decline that, that we saw back in 2008 from, from, how, from the housing market? Now, the scenario is with commercial real estate. So if, if any, anybody goes and does a project on that right now and puts it on GitHub, I guarantee you, you get an interview in a bank tomorrow. Because... No one knows what's going to happen here in the United States. There's some countries that are seeing negative interest rates, but not the United States. And, and for, this is the first time that commercial real estate is going through what is what we're seeing today. So, I mean, what what is going to happen? So, you know, avoid your typical um, you, uh, your typical projects and go and just do something. You know, even if you don't get fired, do something that nobody is doing right now. It's something that the, the employer actually is contemplating, you know. In that, once you get into the interview, then you call the big guns. I mean, I remember Michael helping me out, pointing me to when, when oh, not Michael, uh, Mikiko. Um, I don't know if you remember, I, I asked you last year, do you know this model? And you pointed out to me through this one book and that's how I went from second interview to third interview because during the interview I was like, you know what? I saw that model, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, I had to go through five interviews to get the job, but it was like, you know, get one step at a time. And you start building out one, one interview at a time. So if you want the big, the big job with the big uh, high paycheck, you, you got to go one step at a time. Don't, don't try to do everything at once. That's my opinion. There you go, Shantanel. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, let's open it up to Jacqueline. If you got a question, go for it. And after Jacqueline, uh, we'll go to Greg Coquillo. Greg Coquillo wants to uh, ask a question. Then after Greg, we'll see if Matthew Plaza has a question. Hi, everyone. So going back to the topic of uh, domain expertise that Monica brought up, what would be the advice uh, that you would that you would give to someone like me that's starting in the field? Like, how could I develop uh, this uh, skill? Monica, do you want to want to tackle that? Then after Monica, let's hear from Nicole or or Jennifer on that one. Sure. Do you have an industry in mind already that you want to get into? 
I'm still keeping my options open, but um, recently I've looked into maybe retail or more in the tech industry. Okay, so that would be the first thing is to kind of nail down an area or a few areas that you want to dive deeper into because I've got a lot of questions where, you know, people want to get into data science and my next question is, well, where do you want to work? And they say, well, I want to work in a data science team. Well, there's data science teams all over the place <laughs> and that domain expertise really will get you far. So pick a couple of those industries that you want to focus on and understand what kind of problems that they're trying to solve. So if it's the retail industry or if it's um, in a general tech or maybe a healthcare tech industry, just really focus on those problems that they're having and how you can solve those problems. Nicole? What do you think? I think Monica's suggestion to start with the industry is, is a great one. In terms of potential projects, I also really love projects that are focused on your local city because that data is really easy to find. Most municipalities have an open data portal and everybody that you encounter at like any networking event that's you know in that city is gonna immediately be interested in the topic. They're gonna, you know, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, where do you find out about my neighborhood? Um, so that's another great place to start if you're kind of like looking for um, interesting questions that haven't been answered yet. So I definitely recommend that. Um, you know, you can't go wrong with just brushing up on your Python skills and also learning a data visualization tool. I mean, we've talked about Tableau a lot in this session particularly, but um, I think people maybe don't know that Tableau public is free. And so long as you're using publicly available data, um, data that uh, it doesn't matter if it's exposed, like it will be, like the underlying data will be shown um, publicly, then you can even post your post your visualizations to the cloud using that platform. So it's a great tool, not just for EDA, but also for, um, you know, if you build a model and then you have a resulting data set, then you can visualize that in Tableau. Awesome advice, Nicole, thank you. Um, so Jennifer, do you have anything to add on to that? And then after that, okay, uh, Greg, any advice on how to get domain expertise? And then after that, you can go for your question. So domain domain expertise. Can you guys hear me? Um, domain expertise is is research, right? So uh, if you're an independent one, you're not going through school. Uh, there there's there's so many um, information out there. Uh, become part of a community that is doing the same thing as you. You know that is that is of common interest. Um, I'm not a data scientist, but yet I joined this community so I can learn, right? And, and that gives me some sort of level of domain expertise. So it starts with your research um, and it's definitely needed. It gets you uh, more than half uh, of the way uh, in terms of getting somebody to hire you. So Jacqueline, you say you, you, you're, um, you know, you're interested in retail. Well, if you search more about retail, you'll discover that retail has limits, right? then you will search for people who've solved those limits or issues. Then you start thinking, okay, what are the projects that I can work on that address these issues? Then you become a domain expert. So it, it, it starts with research and then it grows from there, to, to put it simply. I wanted to say one thing too about resume because I couldn't help it, right? A lot of times we want to put a killer resume because we want to impress. We want to make the biggest impression on that person so we have a tendency to put so many things in that resume but think about this the only thing you need is to become the best storyteller with the few words and connect with the hirer connect with what you feel like is the biggest issue and that also starts with research but you already have another thing you already know what you're capable of you already know what you've worked on and then map that to map those to what you think that hire has in terms of pain points, and then say it in simple words. Harpit did say, um, you know, star method is key. I have my resume changed to the star method when I applied to Amazon, and 
it, it worked wonders. That first sentence said any, everything. Whatever project I worked on, I said, what was the biggest bang that I did in that project and why? Was it important? What was the result? Boom, that's it, star method. And then a couple bullet points in there, no more than four. Make it clean, sweet, connects directly, makes that person understand why you are interested in that position. So with that, my question, I want to build onto what Timothy was saying because my mind is like, I want to help you guys to help me understand. Let's talk deep mind, alpha fold, right? So if you think about this, these guys, they, are, they achieved something that's amazing that I think. But they only needed 175,000 samples to train their model and a population of 200 million. That's less than 1% of that known population. And do you, I don't know if you guys read these articles, but who can explain to me, you know, how come less than 1% was enough to determine that this model is strong enough to speak to a population of 200 million? That, that it, it, it feels like amazing. It also speaks to, okay, what kind of sampling do you need to do? How do you determine what that, you know, simple population is to make sure that it's a representative of, you know, you know what you need to be able to, to predict at such precision, right? Um, and then I have a second level to that question is, when you enter these competitions that these guys got into, the CASP, can't, can't remember what, what it stands for. Um, when the, the CASP releases those samples for these guys to compete in, do these samples, do they tell you what the um, task for these proteins are ahead of time to give you a heads up on how to predict the shape of these protein? All right. Maybe I'm speaking a little bit too long. So for the first question, who can help me figure this out? This is about simple population. Sorry, okay. I was rambling. I have a quick note, uh, and I don't think it's going to answer your question, but um, something that we sometimes forget is that like statistics and this stuff is about identifying the fundamental data generation process. And when protein folding, it's a mechanical process. So like it will either fail, in which case it'll be like a junk protein essentially, or it will succeed. So like they're like they're discovering a truth that's mechanical. And that's interesting because it might have a, you know, a true randomness that's very, very small. And other processes might have very large true randomness. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question specifically, but when you ask like, why is 1% enough? Well, that's a function of what the true randomness is because that determines like how the sampling works in terms of being effective for recognizing this population if that makes sense that doesn't answer your direct question but it's just a quick note it makes Thank sense you. any thoughts on that brandon looks like he's frozen oh uh, uh, for me yeah i was just thinking a lot when you were asking that question i i i'm just gonna say i don't know the answer <laughs> yeah neither do uh, I. yeah what about our what about our theoretical mathematician Jacqueline here? Yeah. I you stumped wouldn't us. know either. You stumped us, Greg. You stumped us. So what Carlos is saying makes kind of makes sense if it's a mechanical thing where you so it, it doesn't matter what the population is, it 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 will either pass or fail. But think about this though, the folds, you have 10 to the 300 power possibility of folding. So I was going nuts all week about this one. So uh, uh, that's why I was asking. And sure, but it's like flying an airplane, right? Like the engineering problems, those are deterministic problems. Like the airplane's gonna go up or it's not. The fact that it can go up at a technically infinite amount of angles of like the wings and still fly isn't indicative of the difficulty of getting into the air. So like, I don't think, the idea that there's an infinite amount of possibilities actually implies anything about the difficulty of understanding the determinist process. We're getting to like a weird philosoph like philosophy of statistics here, but uh, I'm not sure the ideas connect the way that you're connecting them. I have an example from the audit world. Um, so I have an audit background and we do a test of one 
if we're testing IT systems. So think about, you know, you, you're putting in your password into your computer. It's either right or it's wrong. You can put it in as many times as you want. You only have to test it once because it's either right or wrong. So I think that's that same kind of uh, thing that Carlos was trying to explain. Yeah, yeah, which, which I believe makes sense. So thank, thank you. Right on, Greg. Great question. Stumped all of us here. Let's see if Matthew Blaza has a question. And then after Matthew Blaza, I'll open it up to, um, we'll see if Mark, Sasha, or Austin has a question. I'm just quietly listening. <laughs> right on, man. Hey, well, thanks for coming out, man. I appreciate you yeah, uh, hanging no out. Uh, Mark, Austin, or Sasha, any questions? Yeah, <clears throat> I actually have a, a question that I'm, I'm facing right now. Um, in my role, it's been really fun to switch from more of an analytics to a product role and building kind of data products. And so I'm curious for others, you know, what's your decision process for bringing in a, a pre-built package or module into your code base? Um, sometimes, you know, like scikit-learn has certain packages that make sense, but like things where you can easily build it yourself or implement this new kind of module. Um, for analytics, it's just like, I just need to do this one off. So wherever I pull in, whatever, but now I'm like making decisions for <laughs> how our product's gonna move forward. Um, and so example of one is like choosing which, what, what NLP package I wanna use. I, I end up choosing Spacey, but there's other packages as well. So I'm curious what other people's uh, thought processes around that. Matt Housley, any comments on that? Although my space bar is not working for some reason. Uh, okay, so so in terms of kind of mapping product and data science together, am I understanding that correctly? How do you choose um, what assets to deploy in terms of successfully realizing a project? Am I interpreting it correctly, Mark? Uh, pretty pretty much is like. Um, when, when choosing certain packages, you know, that balance between let me build it myself versus um, implementing this new uh, package into our code base. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in terms of, a, of product deployment like that, I, I think our bias is always toward starting maybe first draft with the managed solution, next draft with the popular solution, then with maybe something more obscure, and then moving on to customization. Um, I feel like in the data science world, there's a lot of like not invented here syndrome and a lot of hobbyist syndrome. And I feel like every data science team maybe has this like secret superpower and that's the one you want to focus on. And so the other pieces just maybe grab off the shelf if you can. Sorry, that's pretty vague, but I, like that's kind of my thought process. Yeah, that. I mean, I echo what Matt says. I mean, yeah. Matt and I finish each other's sentences at this point, but the, uh, there's, there's a term uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting, right? So if if you're doing undifferentiated heavy lifting, um, by all means, find, like we're big fans of managed solutions for stuff that's not core to you. Um, that's undifferentiated heavy lifting typically. So find somebody, there's a lot of companies out there in the data space right now I'm working on great tools, um, open source projects, if you need to go that route, um, manage open source. Um, there are teams of highly intelligent people, um, very qualified people working on these systems, building these systems out. All of them will tell you they're awesome and they're the best things on the earth and, and so forth. And you should totally use these products because your focus needs to be on what are you great at, right? As is Matt pointed out, every data science team has its superpowers and you're not gonna be great at everything. You're gonna be good at like one or two things realistically, like really good. And the rest of it, farm out. Um, Cause it's not just choosing the tools for your project, but there's just a huge opportunity cost. Cause like the more you're managing software, with open source, for example, if you, if you have open source packages, you, most stats show that 25% of the time when you're using open source, you're also maintaining um, your implementation of that open source package on average. So like, where do you want to spend your time? By all means, do open source if, if that's what you want to be good at. Um, but I don't, you know, I think as far as uh, we're concerned, the, um, uh, so you can't be good at everything. So pick your battles. So Mark, could I ask you a qualifying question? So when you say yes. you're a pro when you're a product owner, what is the scenario? Is it an internal product, like an internal IT system? Or are you building something that's for commercial resale? Because I used to be a PM at, in SQL Server at Microsoft. And one of the first things you want to do if you're building enterprise software to resell to people is you want to check all the licensing, all the open source yeah. licenses that everything that you're using. That's yeah, like the first th thing. Th thankfully, we have a, a legal team. So whenever I bring in another thing, I go into our security Slack channel. I'm like, can I use this? 
Um, so that's been really helpful. I wouldn't necessarily call myself a product owner. Um, I'm more so like we're, we're a team of people who are building out products that would go out to our customers. And I'm the data scientist on the team, kind of like taking the statistics and the kind of models and actually putting that into production. Yeah, so it could be, it can be kind of tough. I would generally speaking say, generally when you're building software and you're selling it, you typically want to decide what IP is really differentiating for you as a go-to-market strategy. And typically you want to own that. Typically you want to own that. Um, and that's typically what we, what I usually did with my teams when I worked in Microsoft was like, okay, do I need to own that? Cool. Then we might want to build it ourselves. So we own that IP because it differentiates and then we can push everything out. Of course, at Microsoft, we have the other teams like Azure and all that kind of stuff to build everything else. But what differentiated us in the market, we wanted to own that from an IP perspective. I want, I want to add real quick, and I fully agree with you, Dave, uh, from a business perspective, strategy is key, right? So you want to, what is your strategy for releasing it to your target customers? Is it speed or is it scalability? Um, is it somewhat, something else like cost effective uh, strategy? So all of these count, right? If you're trying to do it faster, is it, you know, open source that's going to give that to you? Or if you want to build it in-house, uh, uh, is that the best strategy? So always look into the uh, final business metric that will give you the biggest bang for your buck, right? So uh, that's, that's pretty much what I can say there. I can give you a counter example of what you probably don't want to do. I remember at this meetup before it started, this guy was telling you about his, the, the database that he wrote uh, for his company, Matt knows what I'm talking about. And he talked my ear off about this thing and I asked him what it did. He's like, oh, it just stores data. And I'm like, see, how's it different than Postgres? He's like, well, I just felt like making a database. Um, but now that's used in production in this company. So this guy kind of has a job for life uh, unless he wants to leave. And if he does leave, I can't tell you what's gonna happen to that company, but it might not be fun. So that's an extreme example, but that is a real world example. So prime example of why when I was an enterprise architect, I did not like developers. I didn't want them writing code at all. It was for crap like that. <laughs> There's a, in the book, the Phoenix project, they talk a lot about the constraint and I think his name is Bruce. And he, uh, he's like, he's so important because everything runs through him, like every database, every code base, like he knows all the answers. And at the end of the book, after you find out like, Oh, they managed to maximize him. They maximize the constraint. At the end of the book, they say, oh, after we wrote this book, people came, like, wrote to us and said, you would have solved the problem faster by firing him. Yeah. And I was like, it completely blew my mind. I was like, that's almost true. Cause he just, if he's forcing his way to be like the middle of everything, I mean, you don't have to approve and incentivize that. So it's very interesting when you said that code base, database stuff. But we, we have a real life Bruce that we, that we met. Um, there was a guy who was maintaining this um, IBM DB2 database, this mainframe at, at a customer. Um, he had been there since the eighties, had been writing all the code, didn't document anything, didn't want it, kept a silo, right? So we didn't want to share anything with people because Lord, we God forbid somebody takes his job. So he'd been there for a really long time. Then one day this guy just doesn't show up to meetings and he always shows up to meetings. And, um, you know, a couple of days go by and people are like, well, where is he? And then he ended, up, he ended up passing away actually. And sadly, this mainframe also ran their order system, uh, which was really key. And, um, you know, it took a lot of extricating. Uh, they had to bring in a whole team to figure out what this guy had written, right? Um, and so, uh, again, extreme examples, but these are sort of like, you wanna talk about technical debt that keeps accruing at high interest rates over years and decades. This is what happens. And by the way, these things happen. Sorry. I was going to say, these things happen in the. Go, go ahead, Monica. I'll share oh, after. I was just going to say for Joe, hopefully, in that instance, um, it was written in a language that was still alive and not something like Perl. Oh, no. No, this was written in, I think, a very archaic language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bring in a to <laughs> What's That's that? What I've experienced as well with the. With the um, people that just go and build rogue systems and then the companies rely on them and then they're retiring soon with no documentation. It's written in mm -hmm. a language that nobody understands anymore on a mainframe. So it actually happens more commonly than some people would think. It's, Sorry, it's funny I'm hearing these, uh, it's funny I'm hearing these stories because 
I can relate to all of that because I come from manufacturing and I've seen like uh, folks with 20 years of experience, they're the worst trainers. They know all the processes, they know where the documents seat, sit and everything. And when it comes to training newcomers, oh my goodness, they're the worst. They will not share because they're thinking somebody's out there to take their job. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's amazing that I'm hearing the same common threads here. It's crazy. We all do that. I guess it's a human thing. Nicole, did you want to add anything? Cool. So let's see if, um, oh, yes, go for it. All right. Apparently not. So let's see if I either Austin, Sasha, Venkatarama, Naresh, Nick, if you guys got questions, let's start with uh, Austin. I uh, don't have any questions here today. I've just been voraciously taking a bunch of notes from everything in the chat and what everyone's saying because it's so much great information. And I'm just uh, happy to be here and be able to absorb right now. Austin, it's recorded though, just for awareness. Oh, I know. I watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's recorded. Transcript is up and the chat will be up as well. And we're going to have way, an NLP challenge on the transcripts. Our pre we talked about that like three yes, months ago. We're I'm going to be launching this early next year. So you guys keep an eye out for that. And also you guys should be like Austin who has listened to thousands and thousands of minutes of my podcast. Be like Austin. Uh, Why is the metric minutes? Because that's what, that's what Spotify, you know, put out for this. Uh, all right, cool. So let's see. Um, let's see if either Sasha or Nick or Venkata Rama or Naresh, the store Sasha, any questions? Uh, Hi, this I'm just hanging out mostly today. Uh, some nice people offered to uh, give me feedback on my resume, but some advice that they gave was, I'm not sure I agree with, like, but I mentioned it earlier in the chat about the soft skills. For me, it's just a waste of real estate, I think, because uh, I don't think I should be listing like things like leadership and written communication, because if I didn't have those skills, I would not have made it through college, because I think it's redundant. Yeah, I think if if you are have more valuable things to put, like, you know, real estate on the resume is prime. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting that above some other more uh, important skill, for lack of a better word. Um, but yeah, I kind of in line with you on that. LinkedIn, uh, LinkedIn came out with an article saying that the most in-demand skill in America is oral communication, according to their analysis. And I was like, nobody talks like that. So nobody's going to put that on their resume. And I know that you're just saying, like, it makes no sense. Like, that would be a needed skill. So I agree. So, again, Carlos? so some people might disagree with that, depending on what kind of oral communication they're talking about. Just, you know, Fair. Out agree. there. Fair enough. I just felt like the phrasing of it, like, they did a LinkedIn skills gap versus job post and what people put on their profile. And, like, I've never, I would have never thought to type in my LinkedIn skills section, oral communication, enter. So I think there's like a mismatch there. I would say show the skill through the narratives. Don't just like list it. I agree with you on that. Um, so yeah, great point, Sasha. Thank you so much. Let's see. Um, let me open up to, I think, uh, Naresh, then Katarama or Nick. Let's start with Naresh. Any questions, Naresh? All right. Does not look like it. Uh, then Katarama, any questions? Uh, no. Uh, it's actually a nice session. Uh, this is first time I log in, but earlier I had followed through the LinkedIn uh, postings. I would like to see how I can uh, access this chat window for today's event and uh, past events. You got to subscribe to the podcast and keep an eye out in the show notes and it will all be there, my friend. Nick Urban, how's it going? Doing well. Thanks, Harpreet. Uh, no questions specifically, but... I couldn't tell if that NLP challenge was a real thing or not. What was the plan there about? Uh, I'm still donuts? ideating on it. It is going to be a thing next year because I just, I've got a ton of chat transcripts. So this will be a thing. Let me just think through how, what the thing is going to look like. And is the idea to do a better job than something like rev.com or even some of the, the big players? Um, I don't know what the idea is. I still haven't thought completely about it. But yeah, yeah, keep an eye out for that. Um, cool. So I see Naresh is unmuted. So if you want to take over, Naresh, go for it. Yep. Um, so I have a good question on creating portfolio. I mean, I, I've been watching videos, a bunch of different videos, creating data portfolios. But uh, 
I, I just don't know which one to take with process. I mean, with, uh, I can't hear you. Yes, yeah, it's, it's difficult to hear you. So if you can just stand steady and speak right into the microphone. Okay. Can you guys hear me now? Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. So my question is about um, creating data portfolio. I watch a bunch of videos, but uh, I always get confused which which one to pick the best best um, practice. If anybody can suggest me uh, the best you know best uh, best way to create a portfolio. Yeah, that is a, a massive, massive question. The best way to create a portfolio is, um, man, I, I don't have a trite answer for you, but let's just say it starts with a really clear problem statement, a really good, clear definition of what it is that you intend to do, followed up by a, you know, a good analysis plan that you can put up. And then you stick to that analysis plan and you execute on it by having well-written code, no spaghetti code, um, using making good use of functions, doing some good exploration, doing some good data modeling. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, being very generic here, because um, it's a huge question. And I, I you know. yeah. Do you have a specific part of that question that I can answer for you? I, I think you kind of covered it. Um but it's just me coming to education, execution. I'm just taking a back step, I guess. I just got to take a step and go ahead and then figure out which one fits best for me. Uh, but it's just that I'm just taking a back step. But yeah. yeah. I, so in, in terms of like which project would be best for you, I think that has to be very much in line with where it is that you are trying to go ultimately with your career. Um, I think I'll, I'm going to just, flip this one over to Mikiko because I know she's got some great advice. Um, yeah, go for it, Mikiko. Yeah, so in, so there's like, there's kind of like three pieces, right? Like first off is kind of like knowing who you want to become, which sounds like a very sort of existential question, but I feel like um, not a lot of people ask themselves that when they are considering how to build their career capital, because that's, that's what you're essentially building. Um, your GitHub portfolio, oh, sorry, your portfolio, assuming that, you know, it's in GitHub or a personal website, most likely in GitHub, um, you know, your portfolio, your resume, your LinkedIn, uh, those should all really be just extensions of like the sort of idea you have for your kind of like future destination, right? So that's that first piece is understanding kind of like, you know, the kind of work that you want to do and not just like the title, like data scientist, analytics engineer, data analyst, machine learning researcher. Um, but specifically, like, you know, which bucket do you want to be doing strategy and like analytics? Like, do you want to be that intro consultant? Do you want to be doing research? Uh, do you want to be doing more like engineering work? Right? If you understand kind of like what bucket you sort of want to be doing work in, um, that's like a good first step. Because I think that will sort of determine to some degree the kind of portfolio you put together, right? So, for example, if you are someone who is aiming for like a research role, Right, let's say like at Google Brain, right, or DeepMind, um, then most likely what they're gonna wanna see is familiarity with some of the more sort of recent cutting edge tools and also the ability to like implement research papers. That's gonna be like a really, really big thing, right? Um, if you're someone who's going more towards like the strategy analytics bucket, there I think communication, uh, clean analysis, being able to like really properly scope questions is gonna be really key. If you're someone who is going more towards like engineering work, then there you might not actually have to do like, like a computer vision, like full stack deep learning app, but maybe you instead put together that's something that's just like really cleanly architected, has like good uh, test coverage, good documentation. So I think that's like the first part is figuring out kind of like what kind of work you want to be doing. Um, once you then have that kind of idea, then it's figuring out within it like, okay, so what is kind of like the key like responsibilities you would be doing within that bucket? And you can kind of like curate your portfolio accordingly. Now, what I will say is that when you're first learning skills, you don't have to go find like the most niche, you know, out there data, right? You don't necessarily have to go and like randomly scrape data off of websites or do anything. When you're first learning skills, it's actually totally okay to like find really good portfolios or really good projects or kernels and see how people approach like those, um, those like tasks on like well benchmarked data sets, 
And you can find plenty of that on Kaggle. Um, I think once you go through a couple of those there, then it becomes a lot easier to understand, like first off, what might you need to develop in skills? What are the kinds of problems you wanna work on? And then also what would be like a good sort of structure for how to represent that project? Um, we have like a few, there's a few I've recommended people out there. Um, if you're really kind of hurting for like a really clean structure, there's like cookie cutter data science. Um, I would like kind of look that up. They do have like a template that to me is frankly a bit robust for what I've typically used. Like I don't have that. They have a very sort of specific lens with like multiple like, you know, folder hierarchies, which, you know, you don't have to use that like the really big one, but that can be a really good start for understanding like what needs to be in a portfolio project. But for portfolios, I always tell people like aim for quality over quantity, right? If you have like two to three, just like really, really good projects, um, I would spend more time on those as opposed to like trying to do 20 million sort of half, you know, half butt um, GitHub repos. Like that kind of doesn't really look good. Yeah, absolutely agree. Cookie cutter data science. Um, you can trim down their their structure and you know, make it suit your needs. Um, and believe it or not, I actually have a presentation that I'll be giving at dedicated conference talking about tips to make a portfolio project that will get you hired. Um, and promise it'll be chock full of great tips and, and great advice. Naresh, hopefully that, that helped. Um, if you got like any more specific questions, definitely feel free to ask or just, you know, let no, us know. No, Great. I've been attending this past two weeks and I've been learning a lot. So just want to thank you everybody for your time. No, thank you very much, man. Thank you for coming through. Um, let's see if Tashi has a question. And after Tashi, we'll see. If, I haven't even asked if Jennifer and Nicholas have questions. I just assume you guys are here to give advice and hang out. So if you guys have questions, let me know. My bad. Uh, Tashi, if you got a question, go for it. Um, I have no questions as of yet. All right. All right. Uh, Jennifer, Nicholas, you guys are good. I'm just chilling. Right on, man. Well, dude, it's been an awesome office hours. Um, last minute questions. Now is the chance. Otherwise, I'll start wrapping up office hours. Uh, Greg, I see you. I'm muted. Yeah, no, no, it's not a question. It's uh, Naresh's question just made me realize, and also Mikiko's answer made me realize why we struggle so much to determine how to position ourselves in the real world. We spend so much time in school being guided through projects already planned for us, right? From, you know, high school, whatever, uh, university that we don't think about, okay, handling it ourselves. Right. So no wonder we're struggling to figure out how to position ourselves. And if 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 we get conscious about that, the sooner as soon as college, you know, maybe we struggle less. I don't know how to fix that issue. It's just an observation that I made. And I, I think that Mikiko's answer was sublime, you know, very, very awesome. Thank you, Mikiko. Oh, thank you so much. And, to you know, just like piggyback on that, I think a skill that is not taught and it really should be, and I was very fortunate to work with these teams, is sales and marketing, like, and how do you like brand and message kind of like your contribution. Um, so like when I started my sort of career, right, five years ago, I actually had a massive stuttering problem and I had graduated college and I couldn't find a job, right? So I got a job working at the front desk as, as a hair salon in like one of the <laughs> like bougiest areas of San Francisco. So I had to talk a lot, right? And it, it was something that hit me at one point because after that, then I worked, uh, did analytics for sales teams. And I was like, man, these sales guys are so good at like selling, right? Like they could be at like a, a company office hour and like selling the fact that they played ping pong for like two hours, like in the afternoon, drinking, like tossing back a bunch of like, you know, Mickey's and brewskis. And they could kind of like sell and message that almost as like, yeah, we're like team bonding, you know, we're really gelling, we're improving communications, uh, you know, we're meeting with clients. I'm like, wow, that's, that is a lot of, you know, wrapping up a pig in lipstick, you know, making it look glorious. But I think sales is something that's like not really well taught, you know? And I think especially like for people who come from like immigrant families like myself, we're kind of taught to really keep our heads down, you know, like 
be be cool right like you know don't make waves like you know don't put yourself out there right like a japanese family right we have this thing like uh the the stock that goes above the grain gets cut right um so i feel like in some regard to do really successful to be really successful in analytics or any career it's that sales bit it's being able to confidently understand like what is your value and to you know courageously package it to to like say like look this is why you should take notice of me you know um and i think that's something that like it's i still develop it but man like sales like that's like that's the skill that is like worth developing because it translates through everything yeah that, that for me is such a rock star ability to focus on because i think the thing that gets lost a little bit is that when we talk about all the things that we want to develop the skills that we want to develop and how we want to apply them we always think of it in terms of what can we do for the business and we lose track of the fact that maybe a little bit selfishly we're individuals with aspirations and ambitions and actually like you know we kind of want to achieve shit and there's nothing wrong with selling yourself and being prepared to say this is my contribution and being able to package that up and really put yourself out there for your own career progression like it's not just about the skills that you've got and what you've contributed to the business but actually taking a little bit back for yourself and thinking you know what this is how i separate myself from the crowd of other people that are focusing so much on processes and and, and the day-to-day -day job and just being able to to sell yourself a little bit i think is so important for yourself and for your own co career progression oh yeah this is the biggest investment i mean the link i posted in here um warren buffett right um i mean he actually used to suck at public speaking royally um and he had to he had to buy a dale carnegie public speaking course and he said, you know, that was the best investment he ever made. And when you hear him speak, he speaks with a, a lot of confidence and a lot of competence. And I think sales is being good at sales comes down to being confident in your abilities to communicate. And, and it's weird because the, the more, I think the more confident you are in your abilities, the better you can communicate stuff. I think for data people, though, it's, it's an interesting one where there's this tension between showing that you're the smartest person in the room and then communicating effectively. And there's, there's sometimes a dichotomy between the two. Um, and I think what we found is, uh, as a little boss told me once, when I started out my data career, I think it was 20 years ago, I came to him with a bunch of numbers and tried to show how smart he was. And he's like, look, when I ask you for the time, don't tell me how to make a watch, just tell me the time, right? I'm just, I, just, I just need the time, that's it. Um, and that stuck with me, it stung a bit, but I think after that I realized communication is everything. And the people I've seen succeed in their careers wildly are the ones who can sell and communicate um, to their peers, uh, to other companies, um, you know, to people in general. Communication is a, I think it's an underrated skill, especially in the data community. Um, you know, I just think several of us have discussed, uh, you know, on numerous occasions, I, I would say it's the most important ability above anything else. If you can't communicate what you're trying to get across with data or without data, um, you're just talking, right? Yeah, I've said it once, I've said it again, learn to build, learn to sell. If you could do both, you will be unstoppable. And this is exactly why I interviewed Brendan Kumarasamy for my uh, podcast. We had an entire episode all about how to master public speaking. So go check that interview out. It is chock full with amazing, amazing tips on how you can go and improve your public speaking skills. Um, I spent a lot of time reading up on how to be a better salesman. One book that really helped me this year was The Art of Selling Anything. Another one was To Sell is Human by Daniel Pink. Uh, those are two books that I highly recommend. Um, there's also the Cialdini book, which is Persuasion, an excellent book to read as well. Highly recommend um, those. Um, yeah, those are excellent reads. Any other last minute questions here? All right, guys. Well, I've got a very, very special episode releasing on Monday for the podcast. Special to me, at least. I interviewed uh, Donald Robertson. He wrote the book, uh, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. He wrote Stoicism and the Art of Happiness and a few other books. Um, he's releasing a graphic novel about the life of Marcus Aurelius. So I think it's going to be a very, um, just a very good episode right before the holidays. You guys are really going to enjoy it. So definitely tune into that. Um, that's going to be the last interview episode of the year. Then on the 14th, we'll release a 
year end wrap up two more office hours left in the year you guys um, thank you so much for coming thank you so much for hanging out remember you got one life on this planet so go and try to do something big my friends take care have a good rest of the weekend and we'll catch you next friday at the office hours Bye. you too everybody thank you thank you <laughs>